and just like that we are live. Uh, hello, hello. Welcome to episode three out of four already so soon. Um, yeah, I've got some really, really funky stuff um, to cover in this one, uh, so I'm going to leap right into it. Um, uh, oh, just before I do, thanks so much for all the comments and the questions and things. That's um, been really helpful in, in shaping the stuff that we can uh, show to you now and in future as well. With that said, let us leap gazelle-like into A Biohacker's Guide to Fly Fishing, Part 3. Um, so, where are we on with today? What are we up to? We have got... Basically, we've arrived at the situation where um, we've built up this kind of idea that you know the best way or the best situation to be in when you're dropped into an unfamiliar uh, river venue, the first time you see it, um, it's kind of difficult often to have real confidence in your approach. And oftentimes you, you might find yourself in a situation where you're thinking, oh dear Lord, you know, I'm just going to be blanking my ass off here because I've no idea what the locals use. Um, I don't know the sort of the, the pools and the features in the river. So it's really, really kind of overwhelming. But when we've built up a kind of a, you know, reliable system that's based on the kind of the biology and some simple rules uh, that the fish use to recognize um, good feeding areas and worthwhile prey, then it gives you a ton more confidence and it lets you actually beat the odds in terms of you know just being that person that turns up and has the kind of better than average success on the day and that's you know with or without a guide it's fantastic you know if you don't have to use a guide to get to that sort of level the other thing is when you do use a guide you're going to get more value out of that guided experience as well because you'll be able to see the context um, that the, the techniques that the guide sort of uses and advises you can fit that into a wider context so you'll actually get a lot more out of that guided experience as well which is great news all around isn't it you know it's uh <laughs> it's the experience that we all sort of wish to have so yeah yay <laughs> go us but that that is really the advantage of having kind of a very structured system to rely on um that's robust it's well tested uh, and it's you know it gets you results um so that's that's the aim of the game here and that's what we've kind of been building up over these um sessions and tutorials so chris Hendricks, just for you i thought i'd recap this right at the beginning <laughs> this is based around one sort of central idea and th the easiest way to say it I suppose is that um, conventional the conventional ways and sequences that you learn things in fly fishing it's often just ass backwards you know it, it, it gives you the tools in the wrong order and it doesn't give you that framework that you need to be successful and to be consistently successful with it so you know learning sort of loads of fly, na fly names and species and different sort of tactics sort of piece by piece I don't think it's the way forward um, it, it slows you down getting to where you need to be Instead, I think what sets you up for success much better is to use a smaller number of generalized rules that apply nearly universally. And that's based on the way that the fish actually interprets its environment. And by doing that and understanding that, it lets you hotwire those uh, feeding responses. Uh, and that's why I've kind of you know, termed it the sort of the biohacking for fly fishers. And it's, it is a kind of you know, tongue in cheek term, but that, that's where it comes from. So you've got this idea, you know, treating this uh, biological thing as almost like a mini computer and you're sort of hacking or, or sort of uh, manipulating those systems to do something that it wasn't designed to do. Um, to convince it to treat your artificial fly that's made of fur, feather, thread, whatever, to treat it as if that were real prey. So that's where the hacking element sort of comes into it. And, you know, I've taken a bit of stick from this and I'm thinking about you, Adam Claggs, right now. But um, the, the, you know, the idea is it's, like it's sort of co-opting a term that uh, came out of a movement in the 80s that was really aimed at bringing um, science and taking it out of the hands of the only the sort of the, uh, the professionals, bringing it into um, the sort of the areas where people could do it just in their own lives, in their garage, if you like. Um, so, yay, you know, I'm democratizing applied, <laughs> applied biology or behavioral ecology even. So that's the, that's the kind of the, uh, the little sort of uh, the joke that um, is actually quite useful. You know, the term, it captures uh, an idea very simply and very quickly. And uh, as I say, that's, that's the sort of the origin of, of that. 
So where did we get to in episode two? We just left on the the cliffhanger of um, what to do about reading the water. It's all very well. We've talked a little bit about, you know, choosing functional fly patterns and, um, you know, a little bit about sort of um, the way that, you know, the fish actually perceive those and why, you know, building up those rules as to as to why and how to use those things. But what, you know, where do you actually go to make this new sort of offer that you've got um, in the shape of the sort of the fly tactics that you can now use? How do you actually reliably put those flies in front of uh, a fish that's interested in actually eating them potentially? So this one, uh, it's really about, uh, you know, learning about that thing that people, (laughs) it's often flagged up as a kind of a truism like, yes, you must learn to read the water. There's not a massive amount of really good advice about how to do that Um, and certainly not something that's kind of like a flexible system that adapts to, you know, the conditions that you're in that you happen to find yourself facing on stream. So we're going to dig into that a little bit um, in this episode and that's that's really the main sort of take home, I guess, from this session. You can see, by the way, just at the bottom of the screen there, if I... um, jump out into the sort of main view there's a a ticker tape um, of the stuff that is going to be covered in this episode so it gives you a a clue of of what to expect Um, so if you know there's stuff that you want to sort of catch up on or whatever you can go ahead and do that Um, so yeah reading the water Uh, basically here's the deal right okay pens and pen (laughs) paper at the ready when it's cold and the water's cold Fish in deeper, slower parts of the river. And fish your flies as close to the riverbed as you can without snagging. And there's good biological reasons for that. And and whether you're fishing in sort of early spring, um, uh, in those kind of like early trout season uh, sort of conditions, if you're fishing in parts of the world where you can fish for trout in winter, then we're talking obviously about winter as well. Uh, In the UK, this is mainly focused on uh, European grayling fishing uh, during winter. So, yeah, basically, when it's super, super cold, start off in the colder and the slower water. And it's, you know, the first layer is as simple as that. When it's warmer, (laughs) you'll be astonished to hear that you should then start edging towards the the shallower and the faster, the more broken um, water habitat. And really, you know, that you don't need to go much more complex than that at that first level of reading the water. And as I say, there's good biological reasons for doing that, but uh, we don't really need to go into those at this stage. Just have it sort of at the back of your mind that that's it's a really good opening gambit to to sort of modify your starting position on the river based on whether it's relatively warm or relatively cold for you know the time of year that you're fishing. So let me just jump out of the way a little bit here so I don't get uh, too much uh, um, in the way of the uh, the video. The next layer beyond that is to understand that the most interesting things in biology always happen at the edges of things. So it's the interface, the join between contrasting conditions. That's what you're always looking for. So I'm talking here about things in biology concentrate around these interfaces. So I'm talking about the join between fast and slow water, the interface between deep and shallow water. Uh, Again, the contrast between shadow uh, and full full light, full sunlight. Um, Even the, the edges and the contrast between physical structure and open water. And if you combine that with, you know, a rough idea of sort of following where the main flow of the river is carrying most of the food, that then takes you a huge way towards identifying where the fish are likely to be holding. Now, of course, they they don't like to hold fighting, you know, the main sort of strength of the current. So, you know, a little bit sort of slower than the main flow is, is often where they're going to be sitting. But they might obviously be nipping into that sort of faster flow or that interface between the fast and the slow. But just, you know, you would probably not believe how far it will take you by just being very, very good at identifying those edges between the different habitats. Oops, skipped ahead there. Um, So, you know, don't underestimate the power of finding the edges. And it's a a biological uh, truism, you know, the edge effects of things. It's, um, It's really where most of, as I say, the interesting stuff happens in biology. And locating fish when you're fly fishing is absolutely no different. So just to illustrate that a little bit, um, 
here's uh, a fish and again depending on what part of the world you're from um just to, to give some sort of context here uh european grayling from in my part of the world the fish in the in that slide is actually a pretty pretty good size uh fish that i was very very happy to uh, to be fortunate enough to catch um and so the the reason that i'm sort of showing it one is that yeah it's, everybody likes to catch fish like that every now and again when they get the chance but at the same time, it also does illustrate that, um, you know, I'm not sort of taking the position of just kind of laying down exactly how it is, um, just, just preaching from the pulpit and, and from on high. You know, I really want to stress this idea. And to emphasize that, I'm going to come back in shot. I really want to stress the idea that the best thing to be uh, in fly fishing is the perpetual beginner, the perpetual student, so that you can always grow and develop. Um, and this is a fantastic example of that because I was fortunate enough to be the guest of uh, my colleague and my friend Tim um, at the Wild Trout Trust. And he'd take me onto a section of river that um, he sort of belongs to as part of uh, his fishing club. And, it, and it's a really, really nice water, particularly for, you know, large grayling like this one. And he'd put me, you know, <laughs> being the, the uh, um, you know, the, uh, the perfect host, he'd put me in on the, you know, the really nice sort of sections of river. And I'd fished through some, you know, really promising looking section um, for, for no no return, no fish. Uh, and so I was just kind of coming out of the, the river to kind of scratch my head a little bit. And uh, Tim sort of wanders around the corner and says, oh, you know, how are you getting on? You know, but I normally catch, you know, one or two nice fish out of that section. So, you know, how, how have you done? And I said, sort of, you know, slightly, slightly sheepishly, um, well, you know, not so hot <laughs> as it happens. Uh, and he said, oh, did you fish along that, that seam? You know, the, the, the seam between the fast and the slow water. I was like, yeah, yeah yes, of course, duh. Um, he said, no, no, I mean, like, right, right on the seam. Um, and so I was like, oh, OK. So I thought, you know, this kind of, you know, six inches away, you know, this side of the faster water, I thought it was a nice sort of soft spot to try and try. But he said, no, no. Come back down to the bottom, give it another go, but just, you know, get it right on that crease, on that joint. So, okay, so long story short, um, I think I caught three fish <laughs> out of that section uh, and this one was the first one and and the biggest. Um, and, you know, it's a lovely sort of proportioned fish as well and a very, very memorable capture. But it, it really nailed home that idea of, you know, the, the matter of inches that can be important when you're trying to find these boundaries between the contrasting conditions. So I, I definitely stored that one away for future reference. Um, and not only on that particular river, you know, anywhere where you can sort of find those similar conditions, it's going to be, you know, it's, it's absolutely vital that you kind of, you know, you get the level of detail that's necessary uh, and that's relevant to the fish. So we've we've spent a little while building up these things, um, you know, from the, the the early epiphanies that I talked about, and then sort of having a bit of a background in biology and sort of mixing these things together. But you know, you can be you can well sort of think, oh, it's all right for biology boy here, but you know, none of this stuff's relevant to me. It, it won't work for me. So let me sort of give you some reassurance on that. Um, do you think? You can remember to use a bigger, slightly bushier fly in, in rougher water and conversely go sort of skinnier, more subtle, a bit smaller in flat water. Yeah, so I think, you know, hopefully there's lots of sort of uh, heads nodding um, out there right now. Uh, do you think you'd be a little bit more careful, uh, a bit, bit more stealthy, uh, just a little bit more kind of cagey when you're fishing in low flat water? And wherever you can, hide yourself behind the broken water. So put the broken water between you and the fish or the area that you're targeting. Um, and thirdly, do you think you can find one or two of these edges in the habitat? You know, the contrast between the fast and the slow, the shallow, the deep, uh, the light and the shade and the structure um, and the open water. There's more, you know, the list is kind of endless, but when you start looking for those edges. But if you think you can find one or two of those, then, you know, again, if you manage to sort of put a tick against all of those three um, questions, then congratulations, you know, I can hereby certify you with an official badge as a level one certified fly fishing biohacker. Because basically all of those guidelines, all of those things, they're based solidly and squarely within the principles that we've been building up um, around the biology and the nature of the fish that we're targeting. So, you know, that's um, just 
don't be overwhelmed is what I'm saying and that any sort of part of the system that you pick up and start using it's going to help you get better than average results right out of the gate and it brings us back again to this you know the secret of all fly fishing because it accounts for not only the you know the way that the fish perceive their prey and how to trigger off that feeding reaction which is what we want to do with our flies and that's what a lot of um, what you know, conventional fly fishing wisdom and, and published material aims to sort of focus on is this you know, the actual imitation that you're giving to the fish. It also takes care of that unsexy part of fly fishing too, which is avoiding triggering that run for cover reflex. And again, I'm very, very fond of saying that nobody ever caught uh, a trout on a fly that was spooked. So this is, you know, super, super important. Um, and it also flags up the fact that um, a lot of people, that they, they fall over at this point because um, they have caught one or two fish at fairly short range. But what they didn't realise was that was all due to the kind of signal to noise ratio and the available cover um, and distraction that they had when they were fishing at short range. And they try and apply that same um, approach when they're on a super, super shallow, really bright um, day, sort of, you know, um, spooky water conditions with really, really skittish fish. Um, and they don't realise that, you know, they just think that the water's empty of fish, but but actually... Uh, what's happened is is that um, they've just been spooking any fish before they've managed to put a fly in front of them. So, you know, that's that's really, you know, one of the ways that you can fall over very easily um, if you don't take account of the sort of the biological aspects of approaching the water and how you present your flies. And so, yeah, that, that leads you to being successful at, at sort of solving the secret to all of fly fishing. Um, again, with the idea of, you know, would this work for me? Um, if I just sort of skip my, my head out of the way here. As I said before, yeah, it's all very well for Biology Boy and his background to sort of use this stuff, but, you know, <laughs> what's in it for me? So, you know, I thought that it was at least worth kind of uh, flagging up some of the experiences that people that we've managed to sort of pass on some of these systems to, how they've gone on. So, you know, <laughs> huge, huge, you know, yes, Steve Hodgson, massive high five from the back of the stadium for this one, where he says, I must have doubled my catch rates, but more importantly, quadrupled my enjoyment. So yeah, massive thanks. And I'm, I'm just delighted that we've been able to play a small part, at least in making you an even better fly angler than you were when you sort of started picking up some of these techniques that we've taught um, through various means. Again, a lovely quote from uh, Ted, uh, you know, your website and the book have greatly helped me move from years of frustrating tinkara fishing to really appreciating its challenges. So, yeah, lovely comment. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Ted. And again, nobody be terrified by the T word, the tinkara word. You know, if, if, it, if it frightens you a lot, just substitute it for French nymphing or whatever you want. But basically, you know, the, the idea is, is that this biological approach, it cuts across any of the smoke and mirrors of any sort of um, techniques. So, you know, basically don't get sort of snooting, reject some of these things. You need to be able to tell whether the techniques um, and the tactics are actually legit and you need a framework to interpret that or not. So, you know, I'm, t I'm here to tell you that, you know, uh, Tenkara as it's practiced in Japan is absolutely legit and it, it's... Um, it's so, so different from the pale and poor imitation that we generally see imported into the West. Um, so, yeah, don't be put off by that and, and do be encouraged that, you know, using this framework helps you to learn any and all of the approaches that you might be interested in for river fly fishing. And again, a great one from Justin here as well. Thank you. I can honestly say over the past year through JP's and your work, much of what I've learned over 20 years now makes far more sense. Now, I've put Justin down as a nymph fisher, pike on the fly and tinkara angler, but also I think he's probably, you know, qualifies as, um, you know, a fly fishing biohacker as well because he's, he sent some fantastic questions through on email that, uh, Justin, I'll, I'll certainly get around to those as soon as I can to uh, to give you some responses on that. But thank you so much for that. It's, it's excellent and really sort of stimulating feedback. Uh, and it is good to geek out on the biology of these things for sure. So you know, huge thanks for that. So bringing myself back in again, um, you might be thinking that, you know, because I've sort of flagged this, uh, this, this thing up about, you know, the conventional wisdom within fly fishing, you know, you might be wondering, have I been wasting my time with all this stuff? Um, and what I would say very strongly straight out the, you know, out the door, 
absolutely not because every new sort of rig or tactic or tweak that you learn every new sort of imitation for a particular kind of fly for a particular time of year whether that's a winter fly whether it's a new sort of design and sort of practical application of a dry fly or something that you might be using sort of you know subsurface but in spring or whatever it is every single one of those arrows that you add to your quiver is valuable and it, and it gives you more sort of advantages on stream so absolutely not it's not wasted time whenever you sort of pick up any of this stuff um, it's super valuable the thing is the reason that i say that it's ass backwards is that conventionally you are sort of spoon fed or you're given you're provided with all of these individual pieces without first being provided with the overall picture and the overall framework of how they fit together and because of that, you basically need to see, you know, you need to have almost all of the pieces already before you can start to get what the picture is. But the, the flip side of that is that um, when you understand the framework itself, you, only, you don't need very many pieces before you understand how, you know, the overall picture looks. But also, um, you recognize the value of each piece and you understand where to slot it in as and when you, you get to it. So you can start very quickly, you know, right out of the gate, you can start having a lot of success simply because you understand the overall picture that you're trying to build up. And then anytime you, you get a new piece, a new tactic, a new fly, you see straight away where that slots in. So it's a super, super powerful thing. And it's more of a sequencing thing than an absolute flaw in everything that's ever been written in fly fishing before. Um, but you know, by forgetting about the biology of the fish, it makes life a much, you know, much, much more difficult. So that's really what you know what we're trying to do here. That's why I sort of, you know, um, spent so long obsessing about sort of developing the system so that it worked in that way. So just um, for let me again get rid of my face there. Um, <laughs> this is, I think, I'm right in saying this is the first purely Tenkara piece of video so that's one of the reasons I was sort of inoculating people against being um, you know terrified by the concept of Tenkara but there's a really really nice sequence of John here in Italy putting a lot of these um, processes and a lot of this framework and the tactics and the approach into action in really really you know to a really really good level you know really excellent example of, of everything that we've been talking about so from, you know, everything from the positioning through to what he's doing with the fly, you know, where it ends up, um, all of those things. Because you'll notice, see where he's standing. He's put himself behind the rocks and the broken water and he's fishing downstream. Now, where's he casting to? The fly that he's delivering is actually going to that join, that interface that we spoke about between the cover and the more open water. So he's hidden himself. The slow motion replay shows that fish uh, giving its position away. And John's very keen for you to see that, so we've gone in even closer. You saw that splashy rise right on the edge between you know, the, the open water and the cover. Now he's re-sort of calibrated his casting distance by just moving his foot there, so that's another positioning sense thing. Delivered that fly perfectly, and the fish just accepted it as if it was you know, a natural piece of food. Another nice piece of angling, he hasn't kind of skull dragged it upstream against the flow, he's walked down, taking himself to where the fish is so that he can more comfortably, more reliably um, net that fish. And, you know, a beautiful wild fish from an Italian stream. But all of the presentation from the size and the design of the fly through to where John was uh, standing when he cast, the way that all his, fly, all his casting line was off the water when he delivered that fly, all of that was absolutely based in the sort of the biohacking um, approaches and that framework. So, you know, just a purely um, wonderful and perfect example of everything that we've been sort of building up, um, but shown as a kind of a proof of concept on stream. And this is the other aspect to it as well. Um, one of the failings of learning the sort of individual piece by piece approach is that it falls over as soon as something unexpected happens that's outside of the sort of the scope of a particular article or outside of the rig that's been designed in a specific way. The great strength about using biological cues is it doesn't just give you a plan A, 
it gives you you know plans A through to through to Z or Z depending on which part of the world you're from, um, and and even beyond that as well. So it starts then to shift your mindset into the idea that when a fish refuses your fly, that refusal and that behaviour, it's not failure, it's just data, it's just information that actually helps you inform your next choice. And that, that really changes your sort of your enjoyment and your mindset on stream as well. So not only is it more robust and more effective, it makes life just much more enjoyable as well. So the thing that I'm sort of kind of trying to sort of hammer home, I guess, is that the, the overall system, it has built in sort of countering moves. So it's move and counter move so that you can sort of iterate through different parts of the approach in response to what the fish are doing on that particular day. So that that gets you well away from that overwhelming sense of like, you know, right at the beginning of the presentation, being faced with that new venue and just thinking, you know, Lordy, you know, I, I am just going to be faced with a completely impossible task here. I can see myself just blanking for the entire session or the whole week or whatever, whatever the duration is um, of your trip to that that new venue. But having those built in sort of um, adaptations, that's really one of the hidden strengths of this this whole approach as well. And how do we actually go about, you know, achieving those adaptive movements? Well, you simply tweak the sliders. Well, what the hell is he talking about now? Okay, so if you haven't read the, the sort of one of our, the, the book, um, How to Fool Fish with Simple Flies, you won't know what on earth I'm talking about. But basically, the main way that we've taught the system so far is through this idea of a sort of a bank or a set of sliders volume controls similar to the ones that you get on like a mixing deck um, for you know recording studios and largely what we've been talking about in the uh, the video tutorial so far you know it's really been concentrating on introducing the, the noise slider and talking a little bit about the stealth and sort of fly size slider but the real power in this whole system is the ability to combine how all of these different sliders interact. So on the one hand, it's very, very simple because you only have to learn a, a small handful of things. But at the same time, it's really, really powerful because once you understand how the interplay between these different um, aspects of these different sliders, how that all works, it makes life infinitely adaptable. And that you know, that whole thing, it started with that initial epiphany when I sort of saw the article that, um, that uh, Stuart Cross and David Calvert put out and that was talking about using bushier flies and uh, bushier dry flies in broken water, skinny sparse ones in flat water. That was the thin end of that wedge. And that, I didn't realize at that time just how deep that whole sort of rabbit hole actually went. But over time and sort of being able to bring in more and more of the kind of the behavioral ecology and freshwater ecology aspects to it, it's allowed me to sort of to understand much better and much more practically and test it on stream in fishing situations so that you can produce this thing that you can actually pass on to other people as well in a very simple way. So that's really, again, when I say tweak the sliders, this is what I'm talking about. It's your plan A, plan B, whatever else. Every, every time that you have something that's not quite perfect, you have something to tweak in a structured way so you're not just kind of blindly sort of uh, flailing around flailing around in the dark um it's a structured way of sort of going about this um so yeah when plan a fails you've got stuff to go to so here we have um what i want to really flag up again is that there are one or two perfect example fly fishing schools um and this is, again, it's getting away from the, the either the snobbery or the rejection of particular fly fishing methods um, and getting more towards actually just understanding and interpreting um, the only two kinds of technique which exist. So there's only two kinds of technique. There's good technique and there's bad technique. And that's it. So oh, oh, you, you might also add in the category of, you know, things that are allowed within the rules, you know, the local rules. But outside of that, you know, in terms of the, the quality of techniques, those are the only two things that exist. So, you know, European or competition nymphing or tactical nymphing or whatever label that you, you, know, you have for that, tight line nymphing, 
it's a near perfect example of this system in action because it's using um, impressionistic uh, flies. It's applying this, this sort of the perception, the exaggeration in some cases, and then the toning down, you know, knowing when to shout and when to whisper with your fly imitations and with your presentation methods as well. Uh, and it's, you know, it's a beautiful, beautiful demonstration of that. Um, and I'm not saying that people necessarily consciously have used that system whilst they developed um, these tactics. But when people have refined it down to a very high level, it just it matches very closely with all the predictions and all the guidance that you find in that sort of biohacking uh, approach to fly fishing. Similarly, Tenkara when it's practiced at a high level, particularly the way that you see it practiced in Japan um, by the top the top uh, exponents over there. Again, it's a near perfect example, particularly because it has this emphasis on very simple, generally wet flies. Um, and they're, you know, they are stripped down to nothing more than just enough education to perform in terms of the the accuracy or the the, the level of imitation that's included within them. And the other massive strength of Tenkara is this understanding of manipulation. So one of the sliders um, is the fly manipulation slider. So it's bringing in the prey image aspect of movement of that silhouette as well. It's not just the shape of the fly or the colour, it's the movement as well. But as I said, the, over, you know, the overall system, it brings in these ideas of colour, um, anti-camouflage, all sorts of things, and these sort of, you know, totally, totally biological principles but expressed perfectly in some of these um, prime example fly fishing schools. And at the end of the day, again, to get away from any of this snobbery, any of the nonsense around sort of, um, you know, this isn't proper fly fishing or whatever it is, all of these things are simply delivery systems. As long as you understand the effect that you're trying to achieve with your fly, uh, and presenting, to, you know, presenting that uh, opportunity, a feeding opportunity to the fish. So yeah, they are beautiful examples, but as I say, it, it's the it's the delivery system that is secondary to being built on top of you know a really robust actual system. So the system and the principles are the important things. You can derive and you can add the details in later for whatever you prefer for your own delivery system. And so this applies to, you know, as I said in the previous episode, it applies to salmon fishing, it applies to dry fly fishing, it applies to almost any sort of kind of fly fishing, particularly in, in flowing water, but it has applications in still water too. So you might be forgiven for thinking that, you know, I've, I've covered an, an awful lot of uh, <laughs> of stuff now <laughs> um, within the, the sort of the three episodes. Um, and it you could be forgiven for sort of feeling that, you know, you've been hit with this enormous sort of data stream of, of stuff. But again, I wanted you to reassure you on that, that front as well. Um, and if you want to give this system a go in anger, um, you know, I have mentioned uh, previously that, you know, the main way that we've taught this so far is through the book How to Fill Fish with Simple Flies. Uh, well, if you stay tuned to the next episode and also to some of the email notifications, you know, keep an eye on your inbox. Uh, if you're on uh, either our sort of our main uh, tutorial list or on the particularly on the Biohacker special tutorials as well, we've got something. We've cooked up something a little bit special, uh, we think. Um, and one of the brilliant things about it is that it's been really, really heavily shaped by you, the audience, and the great feedback that you've given when we've asked for it um, on this stuff. So we're really, we're really pleased, we're really excited by what we've managed to to, to cook up for you, uh, and you'll be able to get you know the first sort of glimpses at that uh, in the very, very near future. So do keep an eye out for it. We're we've been working like crazy behind the scenes to kind of get this together. Uh, and it's just about ready to share with, with you and the, the wider world as well. So keep an eye out for it. We hope you're going to love it. Um, in terms of things that are coming next, uh, again, if you're not already on the uh, the Biohacker special email tutorials, it's definitely, if you're the kind of person that likes to know the underlying evidence and the proof for things without just taking things on face value, 
there's a lot of the details about the primary um, experiments and how biologists know this shit in the first place. So it, it kind of it really lays out, you know, how this um, this uh, these concepts that we've actually woven into the uh, the overall system, where they came from, and how they're sort of you know the the um, the uh, the proof and the, the the strength of the belief um, in it as as a legitimate sort of uh, uh, interpretation, how that all came about. Uh, it's worth noting that uh, do subscribe to the link in the description for those um, extra tutorials because it's not stuff that's included within the regular routine um, DT instructional emails. Uh, and part of the reason for that is that the the new system, uh, sorry, the new uh, bonus uh, emails, they're actually on a different system, and that's a little bit better, a little bit more uh, flexible in the way that we can avoid actually resending and duplicating information that we send to you. So we, we can be a, a you know a lot more respectful of your inbox um, using that newer system. So that's one of the main reasons that we you know put you or ask you to go onto that uh, that separate system there. Um, so with that said, um, I'd like to, to sort of sign off at that point um, and again re reiterate that do look out for the, uh, the next episode. It was due to be um, released tomorrow, which is um, Friday, but it's going to be put back a little bit um, as I record this at least. So it depends if you're watching this on replay or live, but it's going to be put back a little bit to, to Monday to allow us to... Um, to, to get over some technical issues that we've uh, we've had in putting some of this stuff together. So do keep an eye out for it. It's coming very, very soon. Uh, we'd be delighted to respond to your comments, uh, questions, whether that's on the blog, whether it's in the Facebook groups or wherever you see um, this video in, uh, embedded. So yeah, please, please do feel free to comment. Um, we'll look forward to uh, to sharing that and to sort of being challenged by some of uh, the uh, the questions and, uh, and maybe, you know, some of the controversy that might come up around the system as well. So with that said, I look forward to catching you in the next episode. Take care until then.